Hey everyone, welcome to part eight of our V2 Azure Masterclass. And in this part, I wanna explore application services. Now, given the direction of the industry, a huge part of these services will all be around containers. So I wanna start off with well, what are containers, then look at Azure Container Instances, Azure Kubernetes Services, Azure Spring Cloud, Azure Cloud Apps, and then just the original PaaS app service. We're gonna explore all of those different things. Now to start with, it's important to understand the idea of pets. And we used to say cattle, but I know it's offensive to some people, so we gotta say tin soldiers. And the idea is that as we move from virtual machines to application services, we have this idea of pets and tin soldiers, and it becomes more and more important. I can really break it down and think of it. So if we think of a pet, so I have the idea of, I'm gonna be really quick, some pet, we'll say it's Garfield. Garfield's very happy. So we have a pet. And if I think about a pet, the idea of it being a pet is normally it's some named instance. It's got some special unique configuration, which means that I have to care for it so it's cared for. I have to patch it, I have to heal it if there's a problem. It typically corresponds with it has some state inside that type of resource. And the resource we really think about a lot is a virtual machine. Hey, a domain controller, my SQL server, it has some state. Whereas ideally what we wanna get to is there's no state. Now remember, we're talking about no state in terms of the resource itself. There absolutely may be state in the architecture, but the state is on some backend database tier, for example. So here we'd think of the idea of, well, it's some kind of tin soldier within there, it looks maybe more like an X-Man or something, but it's the tin soldier and they're not unique. They are just cloned. So I have some base template, some image, whatever it is, I clone it, I can replace it very simply. If something happens to one of these, I just delete it and I recreate it. I don't try and heal it, I don't try and troubleshoot it. There's nothing unique or special about my tin soldiers. If it's broke, I just destroy it. Now we think about these, it might be, we can start off with virtual machine scale sets, but then things like containers, and all the other services, Azure Virtual Desktop, that are built on top of this. And where possible, we like this idea of, there's nothing unique about it. It's just cloned from some image. Because also this helps us shift responsibility. If I'm in this world and it's a VM, remember, what am I responsible for? Well, I'm responsible for things like the OS. I'm responsible for things like, hey, the runtime, making sure it's, updated the .NET, the J2E, whatever it is, I have to take care of that. Whereas in this world, I don't care. My focus is my app. That's really all I have to focus on. I don't care about, these things are just managed for me. So as much as possible, I wanna get to this world of tin soldiers. And this is the focus of the app services, the platform as a service, because this, this is an infrastructure as a service. In the PaaS world, I'm not responsible for those components. That's just done for me. And that's what we're gonna focus on. Now the starting point for this is containers. If I think about a virtual machine, with a virtual machine, what are we virtualizing? We're virtualizing the hardware. And I'll draw this out in a second. Whereas if I think about a container, well, what we do is it virtualizes the operating system. So a VM virtualizes the hardware, a container virtualizes the operating system. Now there's many components of the operating system that makes this work, and we'll go through some of these. But it's all about still giving me the different types of isolations I need, but now instead of it coming from an entire operating system, I get the benefit now just from, hey, some construct within the operating system. I don't have to create these different virtual machines. So if you think historically, so historically I could think about, well, I had the hardware, 
And remember that hardware has the CPU, it has the memory, it has the storage, it has the network connectivity. On top of that, I would put some kind of hypervisor. Now, obviously in Azure, that's Hyper-V, but it could be uh, ESX on-premises or there's others. And then I create these virtual machines. So I'm creating these virtual machines on top of that hypervisor. Now inside each of those virtual machines, so I'm creating these VMs, it has a certain amount of virtualized resource from the hardware. It has a certain amount of virtual CPU, a certain amount of memory, a certain amount of storage. It has some connectivity given to it. And then inside that virtual machine though, well, I have to stand up an operating system. I have to install various runtimes or libraries, whatever's required. And then I can put my application onto it. In this virtual machine, what well, it has its own operating system, its own runtimes, maybe it uses some different ones, uh, and then it's got its app. And the challenge with this approach is, well, in every single one of these, all of this essentially is a tax in a way, it's costing me. It's costing me CPU cycles, it's costing me memory, it's costing me disk space, because every one of them is running its own instance of an operating system. Even if it's a very simple little file server, it's running a complete OS. The bits on the disk for that OS, the amount of CPU to process core functions of the OS, takes up a certain amount of memory. Now what this does give me though, and it's very attractive, is isolation. Every application is in its own complete set of virtualized hardware. There is no shared process space, there's no shared network stack, there's no shared resources. So I get isolated namespaces um, because it's just it's a whole own operating system. If I'm not gonna use the term namespace here, I'm just gonna say it has complete virtual hardware and it has complete separate OS, including the kernel and everything inside there. So it has this really powerful isolation, which is fantastic, but I have this very expensive tax, which is not attractive. So we can take this and we have the same idea, obviously there's still hardware. There may or may not be a hypervisor, but it is very common. You would still run this on some kind of hypervisor. But now the point is you're gonna create, I'll do it bigger. We have some virtual machines still, absolutely. Now in this virtual machine, obviously there's still an operating system. There's still an OS there. But now what we have is we have some kind of container runtime. So there's some container runtime, and often this is container D, as we're gonna see. Now this container runtime is responsible for creating these various constructs in the operating system that are gonna let us isolate. So now the isolation is gonna come in the space of various types of namespaces. Process namespaces, um, network, I'm also gonna have these virtual file systems. And now inside here, instead of creating virtual machines, in this level, I'm gonna create, well you guessed it, containers. Now a key point here is, they have some container image that they run. So on each of these, they're running an image. Now they can each be different images. So they're running some image, which can be different. Now the image is made up of layers, and this is the key point. So this container image is what the actual app running inside it, so app one, app two, sees. But it is running on a shared kernel. It is not a complete copy of the operating system. If I think about the kernel mode space, they're using a shared kernel mode space, whereas with a virtual machine, it's a completely isolated operating system. It's its own kernel, its own user mode space, where the actual applications run. 
which is why I could have a Linux VM and a Windows VM on the same physical box, because they've each got their own complete copy of the operating system. Here it's a shared kernel, and that's what gives us a lot of the flexibility I'm not wasting. There's no sh tax anymore of the entire operating system. It's running a shared OS underneath. What it gets is these partitions, these isolated namespaces, so processes can't see each other between the sandbox that is the container. They don't see each other's file systems. It's got this virtual file system layer, but because it's actually running on a shared existing OS, they start up sub-second. Whereas if you think about creating a new virtual machine, well, it might take minutes to create a new VM. Sub-second, because it's just spinning up some processes. Now this container image, what we're seeing here, is actually made up of layers. So we have this idea of many, many layers that make up an image. And you might think about well, the base layer, well that has to be compatible with whatever this is. So whatever this shared kernel operating system, it's a certain Linux distribution, well, my image has to be based on Linux as well then. I couldn't run a Windows image on a Linux container host, because it's not gonna work. It's still running on this underlying. So I have to be compatible. Now, there's fantastic compatibility. You have to test exactly how far you can stretch that compatibility. But I could run different Linux distributions, images on a distribution that's different from that of the image. So maybe this is Ubuntu, Maybe this is a Rocky Linux, for example, or CentOS. There are some flexibilities between them, but you'd have to exactly test where that might break, depending on how far you can actually push that flexibility. But it's made up, this is a container image. It's made up of layers. And this is what gives us a lot of the flexibility. So this base layer is probably the OS. And then maybe there's some um, I don't know, runtime or library they injected as a different layer. Then there's maybe some um, service that they've added on top of this. Maybe it's like Tomcat or Apache or something. And then right at the top, so these are all read-only layers. These are all immutable. And then when I create my container, it adds a little read-write layer on the top. So my container can still change things. But if I modify a file that's in the container image, so these layers would be the actual image. And then this layer would be part of my running container. So if I was to modify a file that existed, for example, in this layer, it wouldn't, and it couldn't change this layer, what it would actually do is it would write to a file in this read-write layer that would supersede the files in the lower layers. And what the app sees is it looks down these stacks. So if a file is replaced with one of a lower layer, I see that higher file. And the benefit I get here is, it doesn't have to store these multiple times. I might have lots of images that use the same maybe set of base layers, but it doesn't have to store each of those every time. I have this nice shared cache on the host, so it only have to actually download one copy of those layers. Now, when I think about that compatibility for a second, I do want to stress, so not only is it the operating system, it is also the architecture, because again, it's running on that kernel. So for example, I couldn't mix, let's say, x86 with ARM, for example. I have to be the same architecture, I have to be the same high level type of operating system, Windows versus Linux. And absolutely I can do containers on Windows. Although we think a lot about containers in Linux, and a lot of ways Linux is ahead of Windows in the container space, absolutely Windows does have uh, containers as well. But very commonly you will see the idea of containers running on Linux. So. Let's actually carry on this just for a second and we'll see a few more things. So I can think about typically a container runs a primary process and it has some life cycle. A container is spun up to go and do a job and then it ceases to exist. We don't do that with virtual machines because they take too long to start, but a container, sub second, hey, I've got some 
job I want to run. Go and look up stock prices for these 20 stocks. Spin up a container to evaluate each stock. It gets the results, sends it back, and then it closes. I can have those very small lifetime containers because they can spin up and spin down so quickly. And I do create it from this idea of this immutable image. And again, it's using these functionalities, C groups, for example, example to meter and limit the resources I can use, namespaces for network interfaces, sockets, route tables, process IDs. I'm using mount to mount objects. So I have all these different capabilities on how to use them. But if we actually go and let's jump over for a second to, um, uh, let's, we'll actually start with Docker. So what we're actually going to do here, let me just reconnect. It's timed out. So let's look at this. And what we're gonna do is, so Docker is what we very commonly think about with containers. They led the way in a lot of ways to standardize what we do with containers. Now, Docker is actually many, many things, and it will get confusing because Docker used to be the runtime, Docker used to be the management infrastructure, Docker used to be how we created images. It split apart a lot of the functionality. For example, the, the runtime, they actually split off of the main Docker. So now it's called Container D. And Container D is actually a high level container runtime that gets instructions from some API. And then the actual low level of creating those OS components to give me that isolation is Run C. So we have Docker could be the management calling an API in Container D, which goes and packages up the, the image and the components I need to a manifest that it gives to Run C that actually goes and creates those objects on the file system. So there are these different parts to it, and I'll draw this out, I guess, in a second. But Docker is still what we think of and we'll use the term when we think of containers. And certainly I can install, I've got Docker Desktop here. I can play around with all these things to show you a lot of these constructs. So what I wanna quickly show is the idea, I'm not gonna do all of these different things, but there are image repositories. So there's Docker Hub, there's Azure Container Registry, and I could search, for example, for a certain image. And what we can see here is, well, there's the actual official image from the Apache project. And I'm gonna do something called a Docker pull. So what the Docker pull is going to do is download the components. Now remember I said there were layers. Notice what it did. Some of those layers already actually exist. So over here, as it's pulling all the layers that make up that image, I had some of them cached already. So it pulled those different things down for me. Now what I could now look at, I could list the various images. So I've got my HTTPD image. At this point, I could run it and I would get a process inside there. So this next command, this run dash IT means interactive, it's gonna say, well, create me a new container, Docker run, I wanna use the image HTTPD, and I want you to file for a process called bash. Bash is your entry point into that container. So if I run this, I'm now inside that container. I'm not in my external container host anymore, I'm actually running inside. If I exit, then I've left it. And if I, from this point, I could do um, various other things. So let's have a quick look. If I did a docker ps-a, I can see it's still there. I can see although I exited it, the actual container still exists. It's just not running anymore. It exited when I exited, which is the whole point. It's doing a certain job. Its job was to run bash. When I exited bash, its life cycle was finished. It's like, oh, I've done my job. I'll exit, it's no longer running. So we control which process that container is actually going to do. But we can build our own container. So I could take that HTTPD, which has a web server, and I've got a Docker file. So all this Docker file does is removes the default content from within the image. Now remember, it's just looking like it's been deleted. It can't change the underlying image. 
it's doing my read write layer saying, hey, these files don't exist anymore. And I'm just copying the content from my location. So I would have to quickly go into part 08. I would have to go into my bad father Apache folder where I have that website and I have this Docker file. So I could build my own image. So I'm gonna say Docker build, as we can see over here. So I'm gonna run this Docker build, bad father into just my current location. So if I run this command, it's just gonna create a new image. And you can see it's done a new layer. I could inspect the history and it's showing me all of the commands that went up to make my final layer. So we can see the things it did before as part of creating those underlying layers. And then we can see the commands I just ran. And if I now looked at my various images on my system, so if I did my Docker image LS again, I'm now gonna have a new image. So we can see down here, I've got my bad father. Now notice the size it's saying is the same size as what it was built on top of HTTPD. It isn't. It's not recopying all that content. It's just showing me the sum of all those layers. Well, that's the size of it. But at this point, I could use it. Now, to use it, I'm gonna do a Docker run again, but this time I don't want it interactive. So I'm using DIT, so it's a detached process. And I wanna be able to talk to it. Now remember, this is just a container. It doesn't have its own external networking. So what I'm telling it to do over here is I'm saying, look, map the port on my container host 80 to port 80 inside the container. I want you to name the container bad father app and I want you to use image bad father. So if I run this, and now just go to my local host on the box, well, there's my container. And there's me and my son on the roller coaster. We're gonna see this app over and over again. That's us on Splash Mountain. And that's him screaming in terror. This was 10 years ago. He's no longer scared of roller coasters, but it was fun at the time. So we can see I'm running that against my local box and I'm mapping to that container. If I was to do my Docker PS again, well, that one we'll see is actually still running. The top one is still there. And I could go and get those processes, I could stop them, I could do all those various things. I could remove the images. But that's, I guess, the key initial point, that we have this idea of, hey, we go and create this image, and then we run a container using that image. So in this case, I had my Docker file so it was my Docker file that was based on some underlying image and then I made changes to it to go and create my new image. And then what I would wanna do is I would store that in a repository. So this is the whole point of this. So I would go and create my own image. So this was my actual service that had Bad Father built on Apache, which is based on, let's say, Ubuntu or Alpine. There's lots of different distributions we could have there. But I'm building on top of that to get my image. So what I would do is once I have that image, there's going to be some container registry. So I have a container registry. And this is where I store container images. These can be public, these can be private. So I create my image and I push it. I push it to my container registry. Now, once again, there are day Docker has its own registry. And as long as I'm compatible with that Docker format, there are many different solutions for this. So I could have Azure Container Registry. And again, these can be public so I can make images available to everyone, or it can be private. Hey, I just wanna use it in my organization. And I built that bad father actually just recently. So if we go and look for a second, so what I did this morning, before I started recording, is I did that rebuild. And if we go and look at my container registry, we can see I've got container registry Savile Tech, 
And if I look at my repository, there's my bad father image. And we can see, yep, I built it this morning at 5 a.m. I get up at three on Sunday, so for every day. So I built it this morning and we can see, and I've tagged it, so you have tags. So tags are a way to identify different versions of an image. And latest just means if I don't specify a particular version, hey, that's the one I actually want. But one of the nice things I can do is with these repositories, I can have replicas. So I might want replicas all throughout the world. And that would make a lot of sense. Because if I was gonna create container instances in different regions, I don't want a reliance necessarily on a container registry in a different region. What if there was a problem there? And think of the speed. When I talk about how quickly we can spring up containers, I have to be able to pull the image. Now, once I've pulled it, as we saw, it caches it. So unless I remove it may be images I'm not using, it would be pre-cached if I've used it before. But if not, I don't wanna to have to go to the other side of the country to go and get the image. So one of the nice things we can actually do is when I have things like Ace Azure Container Registry, yes, it's created in a specific region, for example, region one, but if I know I'm also gonna go and create container instances off of that image, well, hey, region two over here, um, I'm gonna set up a replica. So as I push, I create new versions, and I can even have it configured so that, hey, if the base image I'm building on top of changes, so they release a new version, automatically build my app, so it's always got the latest bits, and make it available in the registry. I don't patch these. I'm never going to have a container running and have Patch Tuesday, or the nightly builds on Linux, and up patch in this read-write layer. It makes no sense. These, remember, are tin soldiers. I don't care about them. When there is, let's say, a patch version of Ubuntu, or, or Alma Linux, or Rocky, or Alpine, or Mariner, Mariner is Microsoft's own Linux distribution that's really designed around containers, is super thin. When they patch that, I just rebuild my image so it gets all of the patches they've applied and then I would update my deployment with the latest version of my image. I won't patch these things. I just rebuild when there's a new version available. So the point is we have that container registry. And I, to bring it all together, so if we think about, well, there's Docker. I remember Docker was many, many things. We think of it a lot around the overall management. We think about it where it has a command line tool that we use running Docker commands. It also has a huge amount around the image management, building an image, updating them. But what they did is they split out the container runtime. And so what happens is Docker now calls uh, container D. Now there are others. There are other high level container runtimes there were some that are built expressly for Kubernetes. They were really designed around that. And with Docker, it actually has a little shim to talk to it. It talks to container D, and then container D actually talks to run C, which actually then goes and actually creates those components. And there are different specifications for this. This is sort of OCI. Um, for this, it's talking, um, there's a CRI. This talks CRI container runtime interface. If I'm having AKS, or I'll just say Kubernetes, Kubernetes will talk directly to container D, for example. And the whole point is when I do some container deployment, what it's doing is from the container registry, it's responsible for pulling down the image required so it can then go and actually create the bits to go and create my image for me. That's the whole goal of what I want to do. It's taking care of really the hard work for me to make all of this just happen. So from a container support perspective, so Docker, hey, it brought containers to the masses. And that's really the whole point. We use it a lot today for the image creation, but even that, we're gonna automate a lot of that in our pipelines. Hey, we push in some new code for our application, it goes through some tests. It will automatically run the Docker to create the new image. It will push it to the repository. It will deploy it to some test environment, do some load testing, 
Um, maybe use Chaos Studio to break some things. And then once that's gone, hey, we'll now start rolling it out to production. So a lot of that will be automatic. But these are all standards. Uh, when I talk about Kubernetes later on, that is really focused on container D now for that runtime. It doesn't go via the Docker shim, it just goes directly to it. So this is really about management, the registry. Yes, it was the original, but Docker themselves split out the runtime into the separate project container D to make it more compatible, easier to be used. So we have the common runtime. There are Hyper-V containers. So this is an interesting concept. Remember, we're using a shared kernel. Shared kernel space. This is fantastic if this is in my company and I trust the other people. If I'm in a multi-tenant environment, I don't trust this container. I don't want a shared kernel. I don't like this. And so one of the things we have is the Hyper-V containers, what it actually does is it creates an automatically managed, very thin VM so that each container actually runs in a virtual machine, its own VM. So now it's still a regular container. I don't have to do anything different with the container image, but it's an isolation to say, hey, I want to be isolated at, at a VM level. So every container runs. So it's going to be fatter. So it's a heavy, it's a bigger tax on me because now it is running a complete, I'll buy it thinner than usual, but still a bigger footprint because now there's more disk space being used, there's more CPU, there's more memory being used. But now I have complete isolation. The same isolation I would get with a regular VM, I would now have with my containers, but I don't have to change anything about the way I create my container images or run them. It's just when I instantiate and create the container, it's a switch. So you will actually, I, I want Hyper-V level isolation from them. And it'll create this automatically created VM and run my container inside it. So we have the Azure Container Registry as I showed. It can do private repositories. It can be geo-replicated. I can have zone redundancy. So it's distributed over different availability zones if required. And as I mentioned, you probably want to place it uh, close to where you're actually going to create the containers from. And as I mentioned as well, it can run jobs. So I don't have to even manually do this stuff. If it detects what I'm building my Docker image from changes, then it can just automatically trigger a job to rebuild my Docker image, put it in my repository so then it can be used by things. So that was the foundation of what is a container. And hopefully you, you get the idea of what those things are. But now let's talk about what are the Azure services to actually use those containers. So Azure Container Instance is, I guess, the most basic one. Think of this as a PEZ dispenser. It's container as a service. It can be Lindo, Linux or Windows, Lindos, Linux or Windows. It's built from, hey, just standard images that may be out in the public repositories, or I can use my own custom images in my repository. They can be public or private um, if it's Linux. So there's a lot of restrictions, again, around Windows and Linux. Linux really is the predominant Linux we're going to see. So with Linux, let's just actually look at this super quick. If we go and look, it talks about the different things we can do. And what you'll see here, some features are restricted to Linux. And what we can see here, when we think about the private ones, so it's not public, well, that virtual network deployment is only available for the Linux ones. So we are restricted on the Windows side. So when I think of Windows, I, I can't do the private. They're going to be public. But it's very useful for a burst scenario. Hey, I just want to create something to do a job quick, some very basic scenario. And I can integrate this with Azure Kubernetes service via something called a virtual kubelet. And that's not going to make sense right now. But when we talk about Kubernetes, it will, and I'll, I'll explain that in a bit more detail. Now, one of the things I can do with the Azure Container Instances is for Linux, we'll actually run in a container group. So the top level resource is a container group, then my container runs inside it. With Linux, I can actually have multiple containers in the same container group. Now, what that enables them to do is if they want to talk to each other on the networking, they can just talk to localhost. 
to different ports, but on the local host, I don't have to know anything else. Hey, local host, colon, 5,000, I could just go and talk to another container running some other process without knowing anything else about it. We often call this a sidecar. So I have a second container grouped with the primary container that helps it do its job, that provides some extra service to it. So with Linux, I can have those container groups. They might have additional shared storage options. Because they would be placed on the same host, they can use local storage and have it as a shared location. You might see like empty di directory, empty DIR. You have secret, which is a RAM-based backed file system. There's extra things I can have with this. Maybe it's easier to just see one of these. So if we go and quickly look, what I'm gonna do is, remember, so I placed bad father in my container registry. So it's sitting right here. What I'm gonna do is if I jump over to my container instances, I don't have any running. To show you how easy this is, I wanna create a new container instance. Let's just pick resource group. We'll call it, I don't know, um, bad, bad father ACI. Region self central, I don't need availability zones. I'm gonna use my own image, but notice I could use a quick start. It has a bunch of them available. But I'm gonna use my bad father. I can pick the resources. One of the things I have here, would that public, private, none. This is Linux based, so I could integrate into a virtual network if I wanted to, but I'm not gonna. I've got restart policy, I could have some key management, but let's just go ahead and create that. So remember, all I did was I said, hey, I want a container and I want you to use this image. So now what it's doing is it, it's going off and essentially it's gonna just create me one of these things. So let's go. Where's my container registry? It's somewhere over there. So my container registry is all the way over there. So what it's gonna be able to do is it's gonna pull, and I want to save myself space, I want to talk about other stuff. I'm gonna pull all the way over here. <laughs> and I'm gonna create an Azure container instance. And it's just this super little happy little resource that I've pulled in this image, and it's just gonna run. It's super, super simple, which is why this is so attractive, that there's really nothing I have to do to this. So if we go and look back over, so it says it's complete. So if we go and now look at this thing, we can go to our resource. It says it's running. It's got the public IP address. So if we now just try and go over to there, There it is. So there's that same Docker image that we created locally and we ran locally. There's my son being tormented on roller coasters again. That's it. And when it's done its job, I'll just delete it. It's that simple. That, that was it. It was that fast to create. It was that fast to delete. Really the only time was pulling the image down and then it, it spun it up. Now what these are doing is it's doing that virtualization isolation. I'm not sharing a kernel. It, it is doing that because this is a multi-tenant service. I am getting that isolation. But that's ACI. Super, super thin, super, super simple. However, yes, it's super, super thin, but often we want more than that. We need more than just one container in some isolated way. I want maybe auto-scaling based on some amount of resource being used. I want to say, hey, the image has been updated. I can't just update all of them at the same time. I want rolling upgrade. I want to be able to discover services being offered in other places. I want easy integration with other Azure services like load balancers or app gateway. I want to be able to have volumes, persistent volumes. So even when the container goes away, when I create a new container, I still have some state. If I do need some stateful service, it's there. I can run SQL in a container. I just need to make sure the storage is somewhere durable. How do I do the networking? I need richer sets of networking. 
I want to be able to have maybe certain taints and tolerances so that I'm more attracted to certain nodes. Maybe some of them have a GPU. Some of them are using Azure Container instances. I need these richer pieces of functionality. I need orchestration and Kubernetes has just become the standard. Years ago, there were many different services. Kubernetes is one. So Kubernetes is that orchestrator for containers. I don't think there's really any doubt anymore. Now, Azure Kubernetes Service is a managed Kubernetes offering. And when we think about managed, there's really two planes when I think about using containers. So if we're gonna say, okay, great, Kubernetes. Kubernetes is our winning service. So I have Kubernetes. This is not Azure specific. This is a CNCF, a standard offering. Now, often you're gonna see this written as K8S, a K, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight letters, and an S. Kubernetes kind of works. So we see K8S, it's Kubernetes. Now, Kubernetes is split into two parts. There is a control plane. This is the brain, the bit doing the main orchestration. And the primary brain is something called the API server. When we really talking to it, when I'm trying to run commands. So if me as a user, it was sitting out here, I'm at my machine, the tool I use is cube CTL, cube cuttle. When I'm talking and running my commands, cube CTL is talking to the API server. Additionally, the API server, well, it has a persistent key value storage. So its storage is the Etsy D database. It also has the scheduler that's responsible for saying, hey, look, uh, I've got this manifest in, or there's been this scaling event, there should be some extra pods or a pod failed because it was unhealthy. I need to get some more pods scheduled. Its job is to say, hey, I need to schedule these pods. They need to get created somewhere. There are controllers. There's different types of controllers for various different things. It's looking at different aspects on the system. There's node, there's job, there's endpoint, there's token, all the really different controllers. But all of these things are talking to the API server. This API server, this scheduler, the etcd database, the controllers, this is all managed for you in Azure Kubernetes service. You don't see this. So all of this, this is just managed. But there's a free and a standard. Oh, right. There's a free and a standard offering. Now the standard actually has an SLA. The standard can use availability zones. The standard supports 5,000 nodes. If I'm in production, I'm probably using standard. If it's just me playing around, it's dev test, sure, I can use free for that. But again, if it's production usage, I probably wanna be using the standard offering because I want an SLA. I don't wanna run things in production that has components that has no SLA around it. That's generally not a great thing to have. So that's the control plane and that's fully managed for me. I don't really touch that in any way, shape or form. So it gives me this managed environment. Now what I pay for, if I'm doing free, or obviously I do pay for standard as well, I pay for the worker nodes and these can auto scale. So this is a key point of well, where do my containers actually run? That managed part, my containers don't run there. So if this is the control plane, this is all control plane. Then what we have are the actual node pools. Now I'm gonna have at least one node pool. So then we have node pools. Now the point of node pools is, I'm gonna try and do this quite big. It's made up of nodes, as you would think. And at minimum, so I'm gonna, and there's gonna be multiple nodes. There's n number of nodes within here. So this could be node pool one. And I need at least one of them to be a system node pool. Because there are actually certain 
container images, we're gonna call them pods, that I need for Kubernetes to work. Not everything Kubernetes needs runs up here in this control plane. It actually runs some components in here as well. So what we'll see actually, there's something called the kubelet. This runs on every node and it talks to the API server. That's how it does a lot of the, the management. So hey, a pod needs to get created. Okay, kubelet talks to the API server, goes and creates that thing. I have to have, remember, my container runtime. So I have container D running on there. There's also a component called cube proxy. This is for the networking. So there's a whole bunch of different components before I even get to my workloads. But I could have multiple node pools. So I could have a different node pool. So I could have a uh, node pool two. And the whole point of these, these are built on virtual machine scale sets. So that they have the ability to scale as we're gonna see, but all of the nodes and node pool will have the same configuration, the same type of VM. But this one might be user only. So it's not running any um, system pods within there. Maybe I use Spot. So I could have Spot run. Remember the really cheap VMs? Maybe I've got some process here that could use Spot to run within here. But then once I have this, what Kubernetes is actually then gonna do is it's gonna create pods. So it has pods. And again, there's kind of N number of pods. And inside the pod, is where it's actually gonna run my container. Normally it's one-to-one. -one. A container runs in a pod. It's, it's just a, a construct to handle it. Sometimes you will hear the idea of, I have a sidecar pod, a sidecar container, which runs in the same pod. Again, the benefit I have there is this sidecar is providing some additional functionality to the primary app. Maybe it handles certain networking, certain traffic splitting, certain services. Uh, for microservices, it's obviously a big push around what we're doing with app services. We're used to monolithic, one big app does everything. Microservices, we break it down into each piece of functionality runs as its own component and they're loosely coupled so I can scale them independently. Well, when I have those microservices though, there's things I need, discoverability, um, traffic splitting, um, the ability to communicate and discover and bind to other services, storage queues, well, maybe I enable that through some sidecar, so my app doesn't have to care. It just talks through some REST API, and this does the work, so I, as the app buyer, don't care. Hey, I wanna create some secret. Hey, I wanna store some durable value. You work out how you do that on the back end. So I may have them within the same pod. And that's the structure. So the whole point is the node pools, these are VMs in my subscription, I would see these. If I was to go and look for a second, so I spun up a, an AKS this morning. If I look at my Kubernetes environment, I have my Kubernetes service, I can see my node pools, and my node pool, if I actually look at this one, we can see the mode is system. Now I can still run user workloads on it, but it means it's allowed to run those system components as well. So if we looked right now, I only have one node. I can see the node image version. So Ubuntu was the standard. It's moving to Mariner over time. We can do that optionally today, but today you'll see probably Ubuntu by default, but again, you're gonna to start to see Mariner. I can see, hey look, it is container D. I can see my container runtime over there. And you will notice it is a certain version. And we're gonna come back to that because that version actually does come into play with some of the responsibilities that we actually have. But if we go and look at the workloads, so if I was to look at the workloads running and just look at, well, firstly deployments, well, there's core DNS, and that's not mine, uh, core DNS autoscaler, a metric server, oh look, I deployed my bad father, so I can show you that later on. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that it needs to do its job. If I just look at the pods, well, there's Q proxy. So there's my Q proxy. 
again, my core DNS. And there's multiple instances. Oh, there's a storage driver, storage interface for disk and file. So there's certain things it needs to do its job, which it's gonna stick um, in like cube system namespace, public namespace, node least. I can create my own namespaces to organize things. If I don't specify one, then hey, there's default. It will just go and stick things in that default namespace, but it helps it separate different things. So we can see that, hey, we've, we've got this thing up and running. So I've got an AKS right there. And the point is I pay for, yes, I would pay for that control plane if I'm using standard. And then I just pay just a regular VM fee. There's not a Kubernetes add-on price. If I'm using standard, then yes, I'm gonna pay a certain fee for the control plane. But then what I'm actually paying for is just the VM price on whatever I did. So if I was spot, obviously I paid less money for that. If it's some advanced GPU type skew, I'm gonna pay more money for that. I'm gonna pay for the number of instances there are. So I have this, this point around it. So they're gonna scale. There's different types of auto scale. Remember when I do my deployment, actually I should show you this. So my deployment actually probably wants multiple instances. If we went back and looked again, if I looked at my workload and looked at my bad father, you actually see I've got two of them. Because what I created was a manifest. So I created a manifest file over here. So the way Kubernetes works is it is declarative. I tell it what I want to be there. So in my service, I said, hey, I, I want two replicas. And I gave it the name I wanted. I told it the image that I want to use. I told it the resources I want it to be limited to. I also then told it, hey, look, I want a service which is gonna create me a load balancer. You can see here. And I want it to listen on port 80. I could also create an internal load balancer. So there are extra annotations I could make here, which I've commented out, but I could make it internal. I could have added that as well. But I just created it as external. So all I do is I pass this manifest, this YAML file, to the API server via my kubectl command or via GitOps or other things, and it goes and makes this the reality. So if I go back and look, the reason I have two is because I said, I want two. So my desired was two. And this is the job of those various controllers and the scheduler to make sure I'm meeting that need. And then I can see both those containers. Now I only have one node because I'm cheap, but it would balance them over the multiple nodes if it could, it would prefer to do that. And I can also see it when and created a service of a load balancer for my service, and I can see the external IP. So if I click this, well now I'm running the same bad father app, but now I'm running my bad father app on Kubernetes. But again, it's public facing. Now I don't have to make that public facing. I have lots of choices around how I do that, but that's what I picked for this particular application. But I said, well, I want two pods. But the number of pods I want may vary. I might want different numbers of pods depending on the situation. So for each of my deployments, which will then create replica sets, which will go and create the pods, I can absolutely say, hey, I can have horizontal pod auto scaling. So based on some criteria I specify, I do remove pod instances. Hey, the CPU is above this amount, CPUs drop below, or memory pressure, add more pods. Now, when it adds more pods, well then, the scheduler has to be able to go and schedule those on a certain node. If it can't, if a pod just sits there in basically waiting to be scheduled mode, 
Well, that's where we then have the idea of the cluster autoscaler. So I have n numbers of nodes, so then we have the cluster autoscaler. And it is going to trigger based on the fact that it can't schedule pods. That's what drives the cluster autoscaler, nothing else. So the horizontal pod autoscaling is responsible for, hey, looking at things that are happening and saying, oh, okay, I need to do some things that um, need some more instances based on some pressure. If it's decided it needs two more pods, but everything was full, and so the pod will get stuck in a scheduling state, then the cluster autoscaler says, hey, look, there's pods we can't schedule. I need more nodes. And then it would go and add nodes to the node pool so then the pods could get scheduled. Likewise, if there's a bunch of free space on the nodes, the cluster autoscaler will say, hey, I can probably bring this back in. Um, I don't need quite this many anymore. So we have that ability to keep those things there. Now there are other options um, for the scaling. So I talked about the horizontal pod auto scaling. There's also KEDA. So KEDA is the Kubernetes event driven auto scaling. It's just a more powerful auto scaling technology. It isn't restricted to just some of those basic metrics. I could have scalers like a queue depth, number of messages on a hub, I'm past some threshold of messages, some richer pod level metrics of CPU and memory. I have just more combinations of what I can actually do around that scaling. So I do have choices for how I think to scale those pods. But again, that would still drive the cluster auto scaler if it's saying, hey, I need more pods. The pods are stuck in scheduling state, nowhere to schedule them. Hey, I need to go and add more nodes. And so this will just go and add, remove nodes as ever it needs them um, based on the, the state of that. There's also networking I have to consider. Now there's, networking is hugely complicated for Kubernetes. I think it's the most complicated part of Kubernetes. So I'm not gonna go into detail on it, but there's actually multiple levels of networking for one thing, because I can think about, well, there's a networking of the API server how do I talk to the API server? By default, it's a public endpoint, but I could make it an AKS private cluster, where then this becomes a private endpoint within a certain virtual network. I can even now do a VNet integrated API server, where the API server has a load balancer within your VNet. So there's different ways that I can make that available. Um, then I can think about, well, there's a networking to talk to a service, and then there's a networking for the pods to talk to each other. So there's, there's all these different levels of networking I can have. But at a super high level, and actually one of the things I wanted to draw in here quickly was when I have a deployment, this is this YAML file. This is my declarative what I want. Hey, I want two replicas, et cetera, et cetera. So for my networking, let's go for um, that color, network. There's two key types of network you'll hear about with Kubernetes. Now, there are various options actually even within these, and I'll talk about them fairly briefly. But it's all to do with the fact that, remember, these containers might fly into existence and then fly out of existence really, really quickly. And so there's a strong chance I don't want them to have real IP addresses in a real network. Because especially on a real physical network, the ARP and all the, the traffic, it would be horrible. I'd rather hide the internal IP space of the pods and just have some network address translation offer some service to them. So for the networking, what we have is KubeNet. So KubeNet is an internal IP space for the pods. The nodes, they still have to have IP addresses from some subnet. But the pods will get their own IP space that isn't in the same IP space as the subnet. And then what happens is there's network address translation going on. Now there are things I can do with routing tables so other workloads in other subnets can talk directly to a pod. 
But this really limits me in a lot of ways because now if you think about it, um, route tables have a finite size. So my route table, I think, can have 400 entries. So I can only have 400 um, nodes. It's going to limit how many nodes I could have. If I'm dual stack, so I'm IPv4 and IPv6, I can only have 200. So this limits me, and it, it's kind of slow, it's kind of kludgy to actually do this, but it, it's there. Then we have the option of Azure CNI. So what CNI is going to do, container networking interface, is the pods just get direct. Pods get a subnet IP address. So I can talk to it directly, they talk to each other, but it's using up an IP address from my subnet. And it's going to be this subnet IP is the same subnet as the node. And what it will actually do is when I configure AKS, I tell it the maximum number of pods I'm going to support um, per node. And it will use that to actually pre-allocate all of the IP addresses. So in my cluster, I just use CNI because I was being lazy. I just really did, did a lot of the quick and dirty configurations. But if I look at my networking, sure enough, I'm Azure CNI. And I pointed it to a specific subnet within my network. Uh, I don't know if I can see it from here easily. I'll just show you. So if I look at my virtual network, I created a subnet called AKS CNI. And notice I've only got 142 IP addresses. I don't have that many pods running. Because what happens is it pre-allocates all of them. So even though I don't have this many containers running, it pre-allocated 110 IP addresses. That's the maximum number of IPs I support per node. If I was to look at my AKS, somewhere in here it will say 110. Maybe it's under node pools, let's have a look. So this is an agent pool, so it's the system one. There we go. Max nodes, max pods per node is 110. So that's what it's when I'm pre-allocated. Just pre-allocated 110 IPs, and then it just gives them out. But there are other modes as well. So beyond even that, there is a dynamic CNI. So dynamic CNI, it's still an IP, but pod from different subnet than that of the node. And it grabs them in batches. I think it's 15 at a time. So it doesn't pre-allocate all of them up front. It gets them as it needs them, but it's a different, it can be a different subnet from that of the nodes. And then the other one is then this CNI overlay. Now CNI overlay, it's like KubeNet. So it's a different IP space from the actual virtual network but it's not using route tables. So it's a lot faster, I don't have the limits. This would be the preferred approach. So I'm saving IP, precious IP space on my virtual network, which is probably constrained the size of my virtual network, which is why KubeNet is attractive as well. So I get the benefit of not wasting maybe thousands of IP addresses from my usable IP space, but I'm not limited to 200 nodes or 400 nodes. I don't have the pain of the time required to update the route table. Now there's some flip sides, because it's not using route tables, I think things like App Gateway don't work with it today. So there's some things that won't work with this model, but that's available to me. There's also storage. So if I think from a storage perspective, what about when I do want that durable storage? How is that gonna work? So one of the things I can do here is, firstly, it doesn't just disappearance, and if a container's still running, and I don't delete, for example, the, that read-write space, it may keep that storage. But if I actually want durable storage that can survive the container being deleted, or maybe I want some shared storage, well, for storage, we have the idea that we have a pod, and what a pod can do is a pod can make 
a persistent volume claim. I need some persistent space of a certain type. So it's gonna make that against a specific persistent volume. That persistent volume uses a storage interface, and maybe this is Azure Disk, maybe it's Azure Files, maybe it's Blob. Uh, this can be NetApp Files as well as an option. There's basic and premium variations of this. This will go and allocate space on one of those batch services. So now it's a durable storage. Obviously files is very attractive that it's shareable. It's, it's an SMB. I can use it across different things. So if I need some storage, one of the things I can absolutely do is I can have this idea of the persistent volume claims to actually get that. Okay, so back to my deck. So there's some nice features. Obviously I can have multiple node pools. So different node pools, some of them might be spot based, some of them are standard based, some of them have GPUs. And we use the idea of taints and tolerances. So I would say, hey, this particular node pool, I'm tainting it, maybe it's GPU. So then pods, I can say, well, I'm gonna tolerate GPU. So then it will go and get aligned and use those nodes that actually have those GPU capabilities. So it enables me to have different types of nodes and use them by the pods that will take advantage of that type of maybe underlying functionality, that underlying hardware. And remember, we have the idea of system and user pools. User pools only run our user applications system, the system, I have to have at least one. The system can place its system pods and I can put my user applications on it as well. I can actually stop and start AKS clusters now. I could always stop and start user node pools, or I could basically drop it to zero instances, but now I could stop the entire AKS cluster. So even the system node pool will stop, I stop paying for the, the compute side. One of the nice things is remember, there's no state on these nodes. They're created from some base image and then they're deleted. So I can actually use ephemeral disk. When we talk about ephemeral disks for virtual machines. So if they're of a certain VM type that has enough temporary or cache space, by default, it will use ephemeral. It will use ephemeral OS disks to save me money. So it's not gonna go and create managed disks for those. It can use ACI. So remember in the picture, we had these Azure container instances that were all happy over here. Well, what I can actually have is, how does the API server talk to a node? It's the kubelet. So what we can have is a virtual kubelet that makes ACI look like this infinite size pool and I can use that. So the API server could actually talk to this. Again, it's gonna be a special type of taint to go and use those to say, hey, I wanna use ACI. If I was to quickly look at my deployment, so in my bad father YAML file, this is my regular one, I've actually got a version that would work with ACI. And what you see is it has a tolerance. And it has a tolerance a virtual kubelet IO provider, and it exists. So this says, hey, I actually, um, I'll use ACI. So I have that ability to use ACI because it's gonna have its own taint and then leverage that. So I can once again get as much benefit as possible if maybe, hey, I don't necessarily wanna scale up to more nodes, but I've got some burst scenario, and let's just use ACI for those. If it meets the type of workload I have, I don't need to scale my nodes, I'll just spin up some ACIs, and that, that could be my burst scenario. User node pools can use spot. I can't do it for the system, but for the user mode pools, I can use those much cheaper. Remember, my workload has to be tolerant to the fact that it could just get evicted. It has auto healing. So if there is a problem, AKS is constantly looking at the health of the nodes. And if it sees this not ready status for too many times, I think it's every 10 minutes does a check and I don't know, I can't remember the exact number, but after so many failures of unhealthy, it'll try a reboot. 
Reboot fixes everything. Have you tried turning it off and on again? If that doesn't work, it will re-image it. If that doesn't work, it will just delete the node and create a new one. So there are steps it will take to try and heal something that's just not working. It has auto upgrade. Now this is actually an interesting one when you think about that shared responsibility thing. Because I said, well, you're not responsible for this. But you have to remember that there is that control plane and then there's the node pools. And there's a version of software on this. So Kubernetes actually has different versions. Every four months they come out of a new version. And it uses this semantic versioning. So there's a, a major dot minor dot patch. So there's different versions you're going to have. This is always one. So it's one dot something. So every four months, they come out with a new minor version. They only support for 12 months. So I have to upgrade. And I have to upgrade. Remember, there's multiple places I have to upgrade. Because the control plane has to get upgraded. The components on the nodes have to get upgraded. The system pods have to get upgraded. So I can think about triggering a control plane upgrade, but then the nodes have to get upgraded. And they don't upgrade anything. When I upgrade the nodes, it creates a new node based off a new image that has the new versions of the new version of the Kubernetes components, the new kubelet, and all of those new um, images pre-cached for things like kube proxy, etc. It doesn't actually patch anything. So I have to say, hey, I want you to upgrade. It doesn't do it on its own today. Also remember, this is running an operating system. I drew container D, but there's obviously an OS. This is still running, most of it's gonna be Linux. This is still running Ubuntu, maybe Mariner. You can do Windows. Those things get patched. Windows every month, is it patch Tuesday? It's gonna get fixes. Ubuntu, I think it's nightly, it does a check. And it says a kernel mode update, well, I'd have to actually reboot Kube, the nodes periodically. There are solutions like QAD that will automatically, it's a reboot daemon that would reboot it for you. But there's a responsibility there. Or I just need to make sure I'm constantly re-imaging the nodes to make sure, hey, there's patches to the underlying OS. I'll get those when I update the node image as well. So there is a responsibility to update those things. If we go and look over here for a second. If I, well, you can see it right here. There's a Kubernetes version, 1.24. That's, that's my major and minor, dot six. You'll actually see there's an upgrade Kubernetes. So I can upgrade the individual node pool. Now I'm already running the latest because I, I created it this morning. But I could update the node pool. Likewise, the cluster. Well, I could upgrade the version of the cluster. If I upgraded the cluster, then it will give me the option. Should I update the control plane and the nodes or just update the control plane? And then later on, I could individually update the node pools. And it will show me the different versions that support it. It supports basically three versions every four months, one year of support, three versions. So I could manually be doing that. Or you'll notice I've got automatic upgrade. So this is a feature that I can enable and I pick how I want this automatic upgrade to actually work. So there's different levels. If I think of these versions, I can actually basically pick these versions. So I could say, I want you to auto upgrade patch move to the latest patch version within the existing minor. I could say auto upgrade stable. Stable says move to the latest N minus one minor version and the latest patch. I could say rapid, get me to the latest minor and the latest patch version. I can also, and as part of those updates, when it updates this, it will update the node images as well. So it's gonna update all the components, it's gonna get the OS patch, the latest version, it's gonna bring all of those things together. If I didn't wanna update Kubernetes automatically, there's also an option to just say node image. 
it won't mess with the Kubernetes components, but it will automatically update the node image to the latest version, whatever, whatever interval that it's using behind the scenes. But there is a shared responsibility for that. I'd also caution you, on dev test, all upgrades fantastic. I wouldn't do it on production, or certainly I wouldn't have production and dev test on the same schedule. If my production was gonna auto upgrade, I'd want it at least stable, because what if it breaks something? What if I have some use of some API that gets changed and it breaks my code? Well, I wanna see that in dev test first. So be very careful of any, always, any kind of automatic upgrade in a production environment. There should always be some staggering and some rolled deployment. So I would see any update in dev test first, and then when I'm happy, then I can go and push it into production. Otherwise, I may see very, very bad things and have a very, very bad day. So it does have an auto upgrade, but use sensibly. It has managed identity. So managed identity is, is hugely powerful. We're gonna cover this when we talk about security. But there's been multiple solutions for Kubernetes because it has a challenge. It's not just like a virtual machine. Because it's a pod. It's a pod within a node. And there's many pods. Well, I can't just use the identity of the, the node because that's very generic. There might be very different applications. I need the pod to be able to have its own identity, which is actually pretty difficult when you think about it. How does it automatically go and get a certain identity? And what's happened is now there are these specific solutions. There's now something called um, the Azure AD Workload Identity. So this replaces a previous solution called the Pod Managed Identity, which was based on hey, the nodes, instance metadata service and, and doing some things. Well, while they were doing that work, Kubernetes, so the nice people at Kubernetes, they were busy. They actually went and created some own native solutions. They came up with their own OIDC, OpenID uh, Connect provider, and the ability to then project some service credentials into a pod. So they have a token volume project projection. So what Azure Kubernetes Service now does is, is it uses that native capability. And there's a few layers to this, but basically what we do is we create a Kubernetes service account. So there's gonna be a user assigned managed identity. So somewhere, I'm gonna run out of space, but imagine there's Azure AD. So I create a user assigned managed uh, identity. And that user assigned managed identity has a client ID. And then what I can actually do is in Kubernetes, I create a service account. And what I'm really doing is I'm mapping this. So I'm gonna map the service account to that user assigned managed identity. Then I create a a federated identity as part of the environment, as part of my manifest, I'm gonna create a federated identity, and this then maps the user assigned managed identity to my service account, to a certain namespace, and then the pod just gets configured, projected in via a mount point, and it just can go and trade this in for a token to Azure AD. It doesn't care, it doesn't have to know anything, but again, I'm going to do a deeper dive video. There's a lot to that. But basically what it allows the pod to do is easily see this service account and then it can grab the service account and through an endpoint say, hey, give me an Azure AD token. And it's just going to work because behind the scenes, we've set up this mapping of a managed identity to the service account issuer, to the subject, which is this user assigned managed identity. And I get the identity for this. So there's a whole set of different steps happening, but the long and short of it, the pods can now have a unique identity that they can use without having to know anything about Azure AD or without having to know some special magic. It can have its own identity. Every pod could have a different identity from other pods on the same node. Nothing to do with the node itself. The node has no access to this. 
it's all done directly as part of the pods. So that's a fantastic feature. And just, I guess, really portal resources and DevOps. So one of the things that they've really worked a lot on is the portal interface is great. So we, we've seen a lot of this already. So I don't have to use kubectl for many things now. I can drive a lot of what I'm doing. I can look at the namespaces, the workloads, uh, the pods, the replica sets, the stateful sets, the daemons, the jobs, the cron jobs, my services, my ingress, sort of my ingress controllers there, if I like Nginx, for example, my storage, my persistent volume claims, my persistent volumes, the storage classes that we support uh, all through here. Really useful. Like in, in the old days, we'd be doing a ton of stuff with kubectl and having to mess around with that. It's very rare you do that. Even my deployment of Bad Father this morning, I actually just went to, where's it gone? Hold on. I did a workload, I did create, and I could either use a starter app or it lets me just paste in the YAML. So I, I can just easily deploy from here as well. And it integrates with GetOps. So GetOps is a really nice capability and what that lets me do is, obviously the, the whole point is everything's moving to DevOps. This deployment file right here what I would actually do is we had some Git repo. This could be GitHub, could be Azure DevOps, there's many of them. What I would do is I would commit this to a certain branch. And what I can configure with GetOps is there are components that we have on here, uh, Flux V2. And this component, I'm trying to work out where I'm going to draw this exactly. I think I'm going to run out of space. But with GitOps, Flux V2, it's basically watching. And when I do a commit to the branch it's configured for, it will automatically go and grab the manifests. And these could be Helm charts, there's different ways I can organize the resources. And through this component that's running on here, it would apply it. Now obviously when it's doing the apply, it's actually talking to the API server, there's, there's whole sets of interactions going on back and forth. But I don't even have to have a pipeline necessarily now. I could think about when I commit, or maybe this creation of the new manifest is as part of my pipeline, I don't have to push it to my Kubernetes environment. All I have to do is commit it to the right branch that it's looking at. It will see, oh, there's a new deployment manifest. I should make that reality in my environment. It will grab it and it will push it out. So the GetOps integration is really powerful and might simplify a lot of the ways I think about doing um, all my various tasks. So we spent a lot of time on that, but AKS is such a useful service. Containers is driving a huge amount of what we do today. And the services we're about to talk about, most of them actually sit on top of AKS. Um, the last one doesn't, but pretty much all of the others do. Speaking of which then, Azure Container Apps. I mentioned microservices and Kubernetes and containers is fantastic for microservices. Some small unit of functionality that I can have lots and lots of them that does some piece of work. They may be persistent, they may last, or they may fly in and out of existence. But if I think of true microservices, to be useful, I need other services to make them work well. And so there's often other components we're going to lay down on top of Kubernetes. Um, Dapper, uh, Kada. So Kada we talked about already. We already talked about that ability to have the Kubernetes event-driven auto-scaling. A number of HTTP requests, a certain queue depth, a certain resource use, scale out the pods based on these various metrics. I can even scale to zero so it could become serverless. Dapper is this distributed application runtime. 
And it's all about giving me this really great portability to, doesn't care what language, doesn't care about what backend services it might be using. To my app, I can just make a HTTP or gRPC call, which is a kind of modern version of remote procedure call. It, it's very thin, very lightweight. And it's gonna take out all of the complexity of this. Now I could install these things myself on Kubernetes, but maybe I don't even understand Kubernetes. I don't wanna know. I wanna just create my microservices app and say run. So Azure Container Apps runs on top of AKS, but it abstract, abstracts away AKS, but then it gives me Kida, it gives me Dapper, it gives me Envoy. Envoy is one of those classic sidecars that handles the networking for me. If I wanna do traffic splitting, um, A, B, so 8% goes to A, 20% goes to B, blue, green, cutovers, um, quality of service, inspection of traffic, Envoy is a great way to do it. It does it via a sidecar. And so, Let's go over here. If I was to think about my Azure Container Apps, the whole point is I can just focus on my app. I don't even have to understand AKS. So yes, absolutely, AKS is still there. I don't know that, it, it's hidden away from me. What I focus on is my application and what it's bringing me is again that event-driven auto-scaling, it's bringing me Dapper, and it's bringing me um, Envoy. And it's facilitating all of this, is it still a pod? Like I'm still having my pod, but I'm gonna have this sidecar. So it's giving me this sidecar that's providing all of these different functionalities around the Dapper and the Envoy. And then I have my main container itself. Now the beauty of what this is gonna do, and I guess I'll focus on the Dapper side. If I'm doing a true microservices solution, I may want publish subscribe to some bus. I may need some persistent state to store things, maybe a key value store. I may need to discover other services. I may need secrets and secret management. I may want certain types of encryption or telemetry enabled for me. I might need to integrate with other types of service. And that's a lot of work for me to write as a developer. Remember, these could be in many different languages. So what Dapper does is this sidecar, well, it's running in the same pod. Remember, once we're in the same pod, what can we do? I can just talk to local host. So I can just make a, a HTTP or a gRPC call to pull, it's 3500 by default, but I can change the port, V1, and then some service, maybe it's state. I want to do some state, and what I'll do is I'll give it a JSON payload. Some key values that I wanna store. Uh, maybe I wanna get, so I can both um, put and get these values. I just make this request to my sidecar. Doesn't matter what language this is. This could be any language. This is just a, a regular REST call. That's it. Doesn't need to know anything at all about anything. I'm just making a call to local host state. Here's some JSON payload. So this could be J2E, it could be C sharp. It doesn't matter. I can have a mix of languages in my app. It doesn't matter. This Dapper is then responsible for actually taking that and talking to some back end. So Dapper abstracts all of that away, and maybe it's, I don't know, Cosmos DB, maybe it's Table Store, maybe it's SQL Server. It doesn't care. I could change the back end store at any time. It doesn't care. It would carry on using the same call because Dapper is completely abstracting it away from everything I'm doing. And that's really the huge point of Dapper, it's providing these services. I don't have to care about some special API in my app. I always just talk to local host. So 500, V1, state. And there are different types of service I might do, but it's just that sidecar, so I can always just talk locally to me. And this is the point. So now my microservice doesn't have to worry about how do I talk to SQL? How do I talk to Cosmos DB? How do I talk to service bus? How do I go and discover services? 
I don't have to try and learn different things depending on what language I'm in. These are just provided for me by Dapper. And so what Azure Container apps are doing, it's providing all of that for me. I just, hey, here's my app, I wanna deploy it, that's managed. So that's the big deal about Azure Container apps. Then we get Azure Spring apps. So Java, J2E, Java Enterprise Edition, is one of the most popular languages. And Spring provides a number of benefits on top of just regular Java. And what Azure Spring Apps does is it deploys a full Spring Cloud on top of AKS. So again, it's abstracting the AKS away from me, but it is sitting on AKS. And it's both an open source software version and there's a VMware Tanzu version. So there's two different versions of this. So there are three tiers. Come on. So if we look at those tiers really quickly, we can see, okay, there's basic for tire kicking and individual dev test. There's a certain price per hour. There's standard, then there's enterprise. So enterprise is using VMware Tanzu instead of the open source. But realize, I then, if I'm using enterprise, I have to bring and worry and deal with the VMware Tanzu license. So here it would go and take me over and I would go and buy the Tanzu. Obviously there's different supportability in these things, but I do get to pick exactly what I need from those. And so what this is gonna look like, if we just go back over, I think my whiteboard back up, over to here, so if that was Azure Container Apps, it's got a slightly different color. So Azure Spring Apps, so once again, there's an AKS hidden away behind the scenes, but what it's deploying to me is a Spring Cloud. And once again, there's both the open source software version and the VMware Tanzu. I need to bring my own license for the Tanzu. But this is based on the idea that I have J2E. But when I'm writing my application, there's often things that would help me, frameworks that make the developer more productive. There's the whole model view controller. So there's a certain model of the data, then the view takes that data and makes it usable by the end client. Then there's a controller, the user interacts with the controller, which then goes and updates the model. So what the actual Azure Spring Framework does is it provides a lot of those capabilities for that model. And then what they created was then Spring Boot and Spring Boot built on the framework but it made it self-contained, it made it auto-configuration. I could have annotations that would really think metadata about the application that would then automatically go and bring in the libraries and the frameworks required. So if I was doing serverless or microservices or a web app or a cron job, it had templates to help me just get up and running so I'm not rewriting all of the code. It simplified all of the dependency management. And then from Spring Boot, or well, Spring Cloud sits on top of Spring Boot that uses Spring Boot to pack all the bits, but now it's really focused for cloud native microservices, but it has a service discovery, so services can register and find other services. It has Spring Gateway, so I can now um, have traffic splitting, so I can do that A, B, 80%, 20%, I can do the blue, green. It has a configuration service to externalize the configuration of my app and now I can centralize those into one configuration store. So we have all these different capabilities built on Spring. So the idea would be that, hey, if I'm using Spring as part of my Java application, well, Azure Spring Apps would simplify all of that deployment for me. And so instead of me worrying about those components, I don't have to deploy the Spring and the Spring Cloud and all the other things, it's a managed service for me. And if I pick the enterprise SKU, it's a joint managed service by Microsoft and VMware. So I get that full supportability of it. So 
as we saw, many things actually built on top of AKS. Something not built on top of AKS, finally, so app service plans. This was actually the original PaaS um, for Azure. So when Azure actually came out, it didn't have VMs at first. It had app services. So this is hosting web-based applications, HTTP, HTTP uh, gRPC, and for Linux services using HTTP2. In the old days, we would hear talk of, was well, it a web app? Is it a mobile app? Is it an API app? That's gone away. It's a, a web application. And then if I want to do an API or mobile app, I kind of just bring my own components for that. But this is a huge area of innovation for Microsoft. They're still putting in a huge amount of work into app services. And it supports a huge number of runtimes and languages that I don't have to maintain. I say, hey, I want it to run on Node.js. Hey, I want it to run on .NET, whatever that is. And I just bring my code to that environment. It does support Windows and Linux, including containers. It's a little bit interesting when we go and look at one of these. So if I was to jump over super quickly, let's go have a look. So if I was to go over here, and let's just go now to uh, my app services. Once again, I've got bad father up and running, but first, if I just said created a new one, notice, I've got a whole bunch of options actually. Well, it can be code, or it could be a Docker container, so I can deploy an image, or it can even be a static web app, which we'll talk about at the end. Now, if it's a Docker container, is it just Linux or Windows? And then I'll pick the image. If it's code, well, is it .NET? Is it Go? Is it Java? Is it Node.js? Is it PHP? Is it Python? Is it Ruby? I have all these different runtime stacks that I can leverage as part of this. And then I just, notice I can do availability zones, depending on which plan I use. So there are different plans, there's different capabilities. But I don't worry about anything here. Like I literally just deploy my code. So I created, again, my bad father. Notice there is a free tier, if I just wanna play around. So I've got my little free tier. Now, it obviously is limited, the amount of bandwidth, etc. But I created my bad father app. And I literally just pushed my code. It's just a Node.js file. So I just, you could FTP it, you could push it with DevOps, you can, uh, there's a VS Code extension, which makes it really easy to do. But now, <laughs> this is gonna take a second. Remember, this is free. I've not clicked this anytime recently. So it has to go and fire up an instance on the back end. If I was talking to it fairly frequently, then this wouldn't be an issue. But because I don't, well, it has to now basically warm it up. It has to go and provision some stuff behind the scenes, make it available, and then my terrified son uh, will suddenly show up. I probably should change this at some point. But that's app services. And I guess while that's running, we'll carry on and we'll come back to that. So it can run containers. So if it's, if it's a Windows app service, it just runs natively. Obviously, if it's a Windows container, it runs in a container. If it's a Linux app, it actually runs in a Microsoft managed container. Or if it's a Linux container, it's a bring your own container. But containers are actually pretty predominant. I have a certain number of nodes and I can do auto scale. Now this comes back to what is the plan. So here we can see we have different plans and I'm using the free one. So with the free, we can see, hey, I can have 10 apps and I get a certain amount of disk space. It's fairly limited. But it's also then shared, basic, standard. Now, once I get to standard, standard is when I get auto scale. So that's that same idea that, hey, I can now actually change the number of nodes based on the amount of work it's doing. And I can have up to 10 instances, whereas with premium or isolated high performance, I could have up to 100. And obviously you can see there's other types of functionality that I do get as part of that. What if my bad father, oh, there's my bad father. So there's my app service and I get that same. This is now advanced Node.js. 
But once again, it's my poor son being terrified. <laughs> I just love it. Uh, my poor son being terrified over various things. And so the way this is working is those nodes, well, we create an, a service plan, an app service plan. So let's now go and look at, where am I on the board? Let's have a look. Uh, we'll go this way. I'm trying to keep it so it at least flows a little bit. So then we'll have Azure App Service, the original Azure App Service. So what I do is that, again, this is web apps. So it's something that I'm talking on HTTP, um, gRPC if it's Linux. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a service plan. Now my service plan is what has the resources. So the service plan has a certain number of worker nodes. Now the thing with app service is there are other components. There are some front ends, there are some file services, but they're multi-tenant in a way. Whereas the nodes, these are unique to you. These, your worker nodes, they're running your stuff. And then within my app service plan, I deploy apps. So let's say I've got multiple apps. So my app one will run on however many nodes are in the app service plan. If I had a second app, it's using the same nodes. It's the app service plan that has the resources. And then what I deploy in that app service plan shares the resources. So if I was worried about an app being greedy, and taking more than it should, I shouldn't put them on the same app service plan. I would have different app service plans if I need some um, isolation between them. But they're sharing those resources. And once again, what I can have here is auto scale. It's that horizontal auto scaling. If my version is, well, let's just walk around. I have to be greater than or equal to standard to have auto scale. So we have this ability to have multiple apps they're running in our app service plan. Right now, I'm using the free, I've just got one running within there. So, multiple applications can deploy to the same plan, but it's gonna be sharing the resources. That, that's a key point around there. There is actually an app migration service. It will go and look at, for example, um, hey, I'm using IIS, I'm using .NET Java, and it can help go and pull that into an app service. There are a lot of technologies out there to go and help you use this. I can actually run this on Azure Arc. So if I have, remember Arc is extending Azure outside of Azure Cloud. If I have a Kubernetes environment that's CNCF compatible, and I've enabled Arc enabled Kubernetes, I can then bring down the app services on top of that. So I can bring down app services, functions, logic apps can all run on an Azure Arc enabled Kubernetes environment. So just an important thing is that I don't have to only run this in Azure, I can run this anywhere I have Arc. So I can actually scale up and down as well. So we can actually change the size of the nodes upwards. Like it doesn't actually change the VM, it creates a new VM. So it will stand up new VMs of the new size, move the workloads over, and then delete the old ones, in addition to scaling in and out. It has deployment slots. So deployment slots are useful if I think about a staging environment. So imagine, this is my app one. Well, this is my production slot. So this is production, say. But I've got a new version coming out. So what I can actually do is I can create a staging slot. So it's still at one, but it's staging. So I can deploy my code to staging it's using the same resources. App service plan has the resources. Apps will all scale across all the nodes. They'll use the same resources. But I could deploy my app to staging warm up the code, any caching it needs, any just-in-time, whatever the compilation, whatever it needs. Then when I'm ready, I can do a VIP swap, virtual IP swap. So what was production 
now becomes staging. What was staging now becomes production. So it's really nice to, to flip that over. And also I can roll back really easily. If I've broken something in this code, I can VIP swap back again. So I'll go back to the old version of production. Now there are some assumptions in there about what upgrades I've done, where's the state and everything else. But on the surface, I could flip back and forth between these very, very simply. So that's what my deployment slots. So deployment. Slots. And depending again on the plan, it controls if I can use those and how many. I have different virtual network integration options. Now again, this does depend on the plan. Not all plans can do the virtual network integration. But if we think about, I have a virtual network. So let's say over here, I have my VNet. Now I can think about two directions of virtual network integration. One is to talk to the app. The best way of doing that is a private endpoint. So I can create a private endpoint that talks to a specific web app in the service plan. Uh, maybe I'll create a different one, PE2, to talk to that. So I'd need a private endpoint for each app. What about if the apps want to talk to things inside the VNet or that the VNet connects to? Well, I have to have a delegated subnet. This is for the regional VNet integration. And the service plan goes and takes over this. So this would be every app in this service plan would now use this and then anything this is connected to. And they did do some updates as well in terms of the, the scope of this. It can get used like connected links um, work on this as well now. So this enables me to integrate with things on the virtual network. Because again, this is for the front end scenarios, shared space. So it's can't just by default, it's not running in my virtual network. I have to do certain integrations to make it integrate with my virtual network. So private endpoints to talk to my service, regional VNet integration, which can then go and talk to things it's connected to. I can do service endpoints as well. So on the firewall, I could limit it to things only coming from certain subnets. But today, most of the stuff is really around uh, private endpoints. There is an app service environment as well. So I talked about the idea that there's a bunch of shared things. Well, it doesn't have to be. So an app service environment, if this is regular app services, let's think of the same virtual network. I'll draw it bigger. So once again, we have a VNet. And what I would now do is, I'm gonna make it a bigger subnet. So I'm gonna delegate a certain subnet to something called an app service environment. So a different, a different beast, so we'll say app service. And what this does is there aren't shared multi-tenant components anymore. It deploys everything into your environment. So and this is a V3. V3 made a lot of changes into its architecture, no stamp fee. It'll be an isolated SKU. So this now deploys into this particular subnet. Now this integration is for data plane. So things talking to my app services is via my virtual network. Now within this app service environment, I still then go and break it down into, what color did I use? I still break it down and actually create one or more app service plans inside my ACE. So my app service plan one, I can have an app service plan two, and then within the app service plan, I still then go and create my apps. And again, this will be multiple nodes are actually making this up. I'm using the isolated SKU. But a key point is, it's also having a connection to a Microsoft um, VNet for all of the control plane traffic. 
So it used to be a problem that on the ASV2, if I did certain network security groups, if I did certain restrictions, I could break the app service environment because it couldn't get to things it had to be able to get to. And customers didn't like that, that A, they could break it, and B, I had to let things through that maybe I don't want to let through. So now it takes that away. It's internal stuff it needs, it's a split plane. The control plane goes to its own VNet that I don't see. Only the data plane goes into my network. So that's what the ASV3 does. But because it's running in my VNet, I don't have to use regional VNet integration, I don't have to use private endpoints, it's just running in my environment. And again, there's no separate stamp fee anymore. It's just using the isolated V2 SKU, and I create those instances and all of my parts um, just run directly on that. So that is the ACE V2. Now, one of the things you may wonder at this point, remember I said, well, I can run containers on app service. I'm running containers on Spring apps and container apps and Kubernetes and Azure Container Instances. What am I supposed to use? Like, why? And it boils down to what is my use case. Um, if it's a single little container for a short-term thing, that PES dispenser, no orchestration, no debugging, no auto scale, sure, I can use an Azure Container instance. If I want more of a standardized, I'm used to the Kubernetes, and I want that hands-on, I want that integration, hey, I can use AKS. Do you know, I really just wanted to get some microservices deployed and I'm using Dapper, I'm maybe using Envoy, I'm maybe using Kada. I don't want to know about Kubernetes, Azure Container Apps. I'm using Java, I'm using Spring, I'm using Spring Boot, I'm using Spring Cloud. That's my focus, Azure Spring Apps. I don't have to worry about that. I'm used to Microsoft, I'm focused on Microsoft, I understand. Azure App Service, great, use that. I can run containers on that as well. There's not necessarily a right or wrong. Some of them are obvious. Spring apps, that makes sense. Hey, I'm using Dapper and Envoy container apps. But it may come down to a little bit of, obviously Kubernetes is a standard, CNCF. It's gonna be usable anyway, it's highly portable. Whereas App Service is, is Azure. It's Arc as well, but it's Azure centric. But if I'm used to app services, if I like the simplicity, because this is simpler than Kubernetes, hey, maybe that might be absolutely the right solution for you. So that's why I can think about, hey, if there are these different options, which one should I pick? Because there's often not a right or wrong, it's just gonna come down to what am I really trying to do? Okay, we're coming up to the, the final straight. So Azure Functions. This is all about serverless. And actually I can run this in an app service plan, funnily enough, or it can run in a purely consumption, only charge for the work I'm doing. And I guess before I talk about functions, let's just set the stage a little bit. So the whole point of serverless, where am I, let's go over here. So when I think serverless, the key point is there's some work I want to do, and that work I want to do, there's going to be some event, and the event is going to trigger it. Now that event could be a schedule, so at a certain time or a certain frequency. It could be some type of message comes in, it could be an API, a RESTful API. It, it could be a million different things. But the whole point is there is something that triggers my work. And then also there might be other services that I either maybe write to, talk to, read from. And these are called bindings or maybe connections, depending on which technology I'm using. So there's something that's triggering me to do something and then there's other bindings or connections that I might read right from as well. Now, while there are many things that can trigger these events, there's a huge number of sources that could do this. So if I think of event sources, there's just a massive number of things. Like I could write a blob to Azure Storage, there might be a new key in Azure Key Vault, 
There might be some event happens in Azure Kubernetes service. There could be something that happens in an app service. There could be something that happens on an activity in a subscription. The list goes on and on. And it would actually be fairly hard for me as an app to know. I'd have to do a hammer poll. Is there anything for me? Is there anything for me? Is there anything for me? Which is horrible. And so, what we have is Event Grid. Event Grid connects to all these different event sources. And then it has event handlers. And it is actually responsible for, and there's different types of event handler. So it could be just be a webhook. And webhooks are one of the ways we can talk to other things. So webhook, I might talk to an Azure automation. I might talk to a logic app, which we're gonna talk about. It also, there are others. I could also natively talk to Azure Functions, which we're gonna talk about as well. It could go and integrate with some queue and there are other things it can do. But the point is what happens here is it's pushing it. I don't have to poll, it's pushing the event to these event handlers. And if you think about these serverless things we're talking about are triggered by something, it's very common that it might get triggered by event grid pushing that thing to it. So that's that's one of the goals when we think about, and so understanding that's a, a pretty important thing. So I'm gonna leave that up there for a second. So Azure Functions is a serverless technology. It can run and use the resources of an app service plan, or it can run in a consumption basis. I get billed for what I use. So it's getting triggered by some event, and they combine to additional inputs and outputs, it supports a huge number of languages. And so if we look really quickly at the languages over here, well, I can see, well, C Sharp, Java, JavaScript, PowerShell, Python, TypeScript. All these different languages, all these different versions. There's actually different versions of the function runtime. We're gonna focus on four. You can see there's lots of different languages I can use for this. And when I create my function apps, I create a function app, I have functions within it, that has some event trigger. Mine was PowerShell. So when I think about wanting to run PowerShell now, I don't use Azure Automation, I actually prefer functions. I can have the same triggering, I can do it on a schedule, I can trigger it on some event, but it's just code. It's just code I'm using as part of this. But I guess that's the point. So when I think of serverless technology, when I think about my options, realize that with functions, it's code. So if I jump over to here, my function, yes, it's many languages. But it is code. I am writing code. <laughs> that's the whole point of this. I'm writing code. So that's Azure Functions. It's hugely powerful, serverless. I can just pay for what I'm using, but I am writing the code to do that. So that's one option. Another serverless option we have, no, oh, you get a certain amount free, you get lots actually free, Logic Apps. So Logic Apps is graphical based workflows. If I think no code or low code, I get a nice graphical interface that I just drag bits of logic onto, I drag connectors and I pay for different types of connector, I don't have to know any coding. It actually is now built on Azure Functions. It uses the functions runtime. So anywhere functions can run, I can now run logic apps in the same place. So it's serverless, I pay only when it's running. It runs on functions. It's initiated by some event. And there's a huge number of connectors and templates to use. But the whole point of this is, if we go and look at one of these, so that was functions. Remember functions, writing code, like code, logic apps. So I actually wrote the same thing as a logic app. And as a designer, this is shutting down a bunch of VMs with a logic app. I'm adding in, you can see here, I have different, based on what I was doing, if I selected git vm detail, there's the detail. 
This was a get method, but there's also things like, hey, I could parse JSON. It just has native functionality to do that for me. It's flowing down. I can have four each. I can have conditions. I can deallocate. For each step, I could say, well, only run after if the step before was successful. So the step before is successful, then go this path. Or if it wasn't successful, go this other path. So I basically just drag and drop components onto this canvas based on what I need it to do. This was me just creating it and I would just add in those various components. There's templates, there's connectors. So it talks about all different connectors that are available to me that I can leverage. But it's just this really nice graphical view. I don't have to be an expert in coding at all to leverage this. If you ever hear about, for example, um, Power Automate, Power Automate is built on Logic Apps. It will seem very, very familiar. And so then we get to the point, therefore, that, hey, well, there's also Logic Apps. Logic Apps are workflows that I create. And this is really no or low code. I don't really have to understand some syntax or programming. I can just create things by dragging and things onto a canvas. There's a whole bunch of templates available that I can just use. So when I think of serverless, um, there's different options if I want to code or not. The decision of Logic Apps versus Power Automate, Power Automate is probably I would use if I'm doing something for myself. Logic Apps I'd use if I'm doing something for my company or my department. That's really the boundary of those technologies. Finally, this is a, a newer one, but it, it's actually really nice. So Azure Static Web Apps, it provides globally distributed content for my pre-rendered content. And that's the key point. There are different SKUs available. So there's free, oh, what did that do? Let's try this again. Yeah, it drew something. There's a free and there's standard. I'm using the free for a whole bunch of different things. There's limits. So for hobbies, personal projects, you get 100 gigabytes of bandwidth per subscription. I can have two custom domains and I get SSL certs for free. It's really nice capabilities. Um, I can have custom authentication with the standard. It can integrate with Azure Functions. There's SLAs. But these are really cool features. So if I was to look, for example, at mine really quick. So if I was to look at static web apps, I've got a whole bunch of them. Some of them I use for redirects. But my Learn Azure, so if you go to learn.onboardtoazure.com, my curated set of learning, I'm running that on Azure Static Web App. It's just pre-rendered content. And this is the key point of this. It is pre-rendered content. There is no server-side brain required. So if we think about what we're doing here, so if I think of an Azure, keep that where, where did I go? Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. Azure static web app. It's pre-rendered. So if it's pre-rendered, pre-rendered content could be HTML. Remember, HTML could have JavaScript in it. That JavaScript could have been created through React. It could have been created through Angular. And then it basically compiles into this. It could be custom style sheets, it could be images, it could be a whole bunch of other stuff. But the point is the machine that's receiving it, it just does a get. There's no CPU cycles that have to get used. Now, I guess there are, there's network packets to be served up, but it's basically storage. That's the point. There's no server side compute required to generate these pages. It's a file, it's been pre-generated for this. And it has a global distribution. Now it is its own distribution. This is not using like Azure Content Delivery Network. There is an option of something called the Enterprise Edge. 
If I turn on Enterprise Edge, then it uses Azure Front Door for the distribution. So that's an option I can enable if I want that, that larger scale, um, closer to even more people. But it just serves up this pre-rendered content. Now, one of the other things that's really nice there, what if I need a little bit of server-side processing? I need to go and check a database, work out something. Well, Azure Static Web Apps will actually integrate with managed functions. So I can have these managed functions. And what this gives me is a number of things, but the point what I'm using this for is I need some bit of server side. I need some server side work done to maybe go and look sync up or generate something. And it makes it transparent to my code. Like in my JavaScript, or I can just, it just talk to, it's gonna be API, and then the name of the function. So then some name. It's integrating natively with that. So there's no cross origin resource, was it scripting, whatever the core stands for. Um, it's also got integrated authentication. So I could use GitHub, I could use Twitter, I could use Azure AD, and what it will do is if I've authenticated with any of those, it will go and populate into a header, it gives my code with that credential. So I don't have to worry about any of that authentication, it's just gonna populate that for me into my credential just straight away. And it's gonna create these functions. If I've got my Azure Static Web App, if I talk about the function, if I define it in VS Code, it will actually go and create the functions, create that integration for me just automatically. So in my JavaScript, I could just do fetch, slash API, slash name. That's all I have to know about. I don't have to think of anything else for me. Sorry, cross-origin resource sharing. That's what the RS stands for. It's just gonna work. Now, my function has to be listening on that full path, slash API, slash its name. But now I just get these managed functions. I can bring my own functions as well. There's a blade, I can add those in. I'd get those same benefits for me. But it's a really great way to, if I do need a little bit of server-side processing, I can very simply integrate with that. And I'm not having to worry about the fact that it's some different site name, a different fully qualified domain name, which would normally cause me problems with that resource sharing of a different origin. The other thing that the Azure Static Web Apps integrate with is Git. So if this is GitHub, if this is Azure DevOps, when I commit my code, it will automatically push it to my Azure Static Web App. What it's doing behind the scenes is it's creating GitHub Actions or an Azure DevOps pipeline to push my code. So when I do a commit to the branch, it will push it. So it would actually do any building required and it would actually um, do the deploy. So I don't even have to think about setting anything up. I commit my code, I've pre-rendered my content, I commit it, it will actually go and bring it into the Azure Static Web App for me. And it even understands things like pull requests. So if I do a pull request, it will go and create a special variation of my app with the pull request number in it, so I can go and see what it would do. I can create branch named versions of my static web, web app, so I can get these consistency between it. There's even things like stateful HTML with hybrid rendering where it could split the path to say some of it go via a function, that's a bit more advanced, but those capabilities they're, they're building in as well. So integrates with managed functions, it's got the DevOps integration. And that was it. So as always, we covered huge amounts of stuff, but hopefully it actually made sense and it builds on the idea that, hey, containers, just really the idea about virtualizing the operating system, I still get that resource control and management. I get the isolation of namespaces and the images. We build on that to bring orchestration with Kubernetes and AKS. Then there are other things on top of that when we think of microservices, like Dapper and Kada and Envoy for the networking. Well, I could bring that myself and put it on AKS, or I could use Azure Container Apps. 
from using Spring for my J2E apps. Well, there's Azure Spring apps. App services, maybe I'm not using containers. I'm just going to bring my app in whatever runtime I'm using and get a lot of great functionality. Or if I like app services, I can bring containers and run it on that. It's simpler and I don't worry about why well, I need portability to any CNCF compatible Kubernetes. I just run it on app services. And then for serverless, there's some event that drives it. Hey, I want to write code. I use functions. I don't want to write code. I want low or no code. I can use logic apps. Then Azure Static Web Apps for that pre-rendered content globally distributed. And if I need a bit of server-side processing, it can hook into those managed functions. So that was it. As always, I hope this was useful and I'll see you on the next video.